Hello everyone, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Earth Day 2020 at Climate Lit. This is our first Climate Lit Earth Day Fest and we are super excited, super excited. Welcome everyone. We're here to express gratitude to our beautiful planet. We're here to figure out how we can be part of the ecocentric transformation and celebrating those we love and showing appreciation for the gifts we're given has always been part of humanity, as old as humanity itself. But at some point we started telling the wrong stories and we forgot. It took a river catch fire in 1969 to wake us up. It took different stories to help us remember. Part of this Earth-centric turn was the first Earth Day launched on April 22nd, 1970. We are grateful to the indigenous peoples in Minnesota and elsewhere, to water protectors and leaders of climate resistance who are showing us how to protect the sacred, the land, the waters, all our relations. We are grateful to the Anishinaabe and Dakota people for their stewardship of this ancestral and contemporary land on which the University of Minnesota campus is located. We are here because we're thankful. We're here because we fight for all forms of life. And we're here because we want to ensure that Earth Day, each day is Earth Day. And we want to ensure that future generations, 20 years from now, our children are able to celebrate Earth Day and then their children 20 years from then and so on. My name is Marek Ozjavich. I'm the founder and editor in chief of Climate Lit. Our co-founder, Lara Sagisak, has uh, had a family emergency. She's unable to be, uh, to be here today. Our session today will be moderated by me and by our managing editor, Nick Cleese. Let me tell you, let me start by telling you where we, who we are and why we are doing this work. So Climate Lit is an online resource hub for building young people's climate literacy with children's literature and media. The Climate Lit website was launched in May, 2021 as an informal grassroots cooperative of teachers and educators. And we are a group of earthlings united by five principles. The first two of these principles are a recognition of where we are and a vision of where we want to be. And the recognition of where we are is this. We believe that we live in a hegemonic civilization whose legal, economic, political, educational, and technological structures were designed without concern for the biosphere. In fact, designed to exploit it indefinitely. This needs to stop, needs to stop now, because we have alternatives. Our vision of where we want to be is this. We believe that we are able to transition from an ecocidal, mechanistic, and exploitative civilization to a civilization that is sustainable, just, and ecological. We can do it, and we could do it soon. And based on this vision of where we want to be, we have three commitments that we all share. One is the commitment to climate literacy. We believe that in order to transition to an ecological civilization, we need to achieve universal climate literacy. Climate literacy is an understanding that includes facts and numbers, but it centers developing values and attitudes aligned with how we should live with our planetary home. Our second commitment is commitment to education. At Climate Lit, we're mostly educators, and we believe that teaching about climate change should be at the heart of our educational systems, centering discussions about issues of climate change in all subject areas and across all grade levels is probably the most meaningful action we can take to empower young people to become agents of change. And our third commitment is commitment to stories. We believe that children's and young adult literature, fiction and nonfiction across the entire spectrum of genres is ground zero for building young people's climate literacy. Liter literature, film, art for this audience are not additional. They are the most important avenues for raising climate awareness and mobilizing climate action. So these three commitments, as well as our professional capacity to create frameworks for climate literacy education is what sets Climate Lit apart from all other existing organizations focused on climate activism and environmental education. Our vision at Climate Lit, our opportunity, is to leverage stories to hone universal climate literacy from the ground up. 
Our mission is to provide teachers with the tools they need to engage young people in these discussions. And these tools can also be used in informal education settings by parents, grandparents, community organizations, churches, book clubs, NGOs, and others. Climate literacy is not a school subject. It's a lived embodied knowledge that will help us build an ecological civilization. There is a show set in the Star Wars universe in which a space knight called Mandalorian saves baby Yoda. I love this show. My, my family loves this show. So I like to think about climate lit in our world. We are the Mandalorians for climate literacy education. We have the stories and we won't hesitate to use them. This is the way. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. Um, my name is Nick Cleese. I am the managing editor for Climate Lit. I've been on this earth for 30 years and I've been with Climate Lit for just one. Um, I'm very happy to be with you all today and I'm really excited for today's program. Um, we've got a very packed session for today and it's divided into roughly three parts. The first part is what we at Climate Lit have accomplished so far. The second is what we intend to do in the near and far future. And the third, we brainstorming ways to cooperate and better serve you and other folks who are doing the work of Climate Lit. We also have not one, but two panels from esteemed Climate Lit ambassadors and prize drawings, which will be announced throughout the session. And we're hoping today is interactive, that we get a chance to get to know one another. So feel free to use the chat as you already are as a space to ponder, ask questions, share resources. And please know that this session is being recorded, but only the highlighted speaker will be featured on the recording. So if you wanna make extra sure that you aren't visible on the recording, you can make sure to keep your camera off. But before we dive in, we have our first prize winner, to announce. So, congratulations to Nancy Flood. You are a winner of a Climate Lit Prize. We are going to contact you using the email that you use to register for this event to get you your prize. So please be watching that. But without further ado, we'd like to tell you a little bit about where we've been and some of the accomplishments that we've had in the past year. And to kick that off is our wonderful content manager, Grace. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited that you're all with us on Zoom today and to start this event. Um, I wanna talk to you a little bit about where I've been with Climate Lit so far. So I'm an undergraduate student here at the University of Minnesota, and I've been working with Climate Lit since the no November of just this past year. So in talking about content, Right now, we have 61 literature pieces on our website. 55 of those pieces have completed reviews, which means that one of our members has gone through that piece and talked about, in summary, how that literature piece further emphasizes our notion of climate literacy and what it means to be a climate literate person. We're also working to create other forms of media being available for, for people to work on and get accustomed to on our website. And we also have really exciting pieces to our website, such as unique glossary terms, which we'll talk about later, as well as other developmental pieces to becoming a climate literate person. So something that I've also been really involved with is the database. This means that all of the pieces that go on our site have to make it through certain rounds of processing and reviewing for them to be something that we wanna put out for all of you. So this means and looks like a person coming to us or us going to them saying that we have media that needs to be reviewed. These people will write summaries about, again, how these literature pieces work to promote climate literacy. And once that's posted on our website, we have a completed journal entry. Something to note is that this database can be tricky to navigate and to utilize. What we're working on right now is to create an organizational base that tracks where we are in the process of a book being reviewed, what books still need to be reviewed, and what has been done. With this project, we all want to work hard as a team to come together to make sure we can deliver more and more content to you guys to make us all more climate lit. <laughs> um, also, I was just so drawn to this project because of how our climate lit website really creates content 
that is a resource of hope rather than a resource of doom in our current climate change um, environment right now in our world. So next, Mayor, we'll be back with the next part of the presentation to talk to you guys some more about what has been going on with our website. Thank you, Grace. Um, so I want to talk about content area, how our creation of content area is uh, the idea behind it is that we need to have a searchable library database of reviews and and uh, and uh, books, comics, games, films, apps, other narrative media, all of these types of content that um, uh, that Grace just talked about. And one our, our, of our goals is to have hundreds, if not thousands of literature pieces on the site within the next few years integrated with three other types of content, which is glossary, events, and teaching materials. And I want to talk uh, about uh, a glossary in a moment, um, or now. Yes, now is a good time. Okay, so glossary. So the, the thing with glossary is that early on, we realized that to be climate literate, we really need new vocabulary. There is a whole host of concepts that young people, old people, pretty much everyone, we need to learn these new words to describe the challenges we're facing and also to imagine solutions and design solutions. Drawdown, restorative land practices, slow violence, interspecies kinship, microplastics pollution. There's, there's a whole range of, of new vocabulary, new concepts to help us name the problems and imagine a way forward. And so literature pieces we create are always connected to one or more glossary items, giving teachers better content and better context and entry points to existing research and related areas. And But creating the glossary presents its own conceptual challenge. And I want to invite Lexi to tell you more about it because she has been working on this recently. Hi, my name is Lexi. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Lexi De La Cruz. I am um, a freshman at the University of Minnesota. I've been working with Climate Lit since February, and as Merrick said, I've been mostly working on the topics um, with glossary words. Um, so one of the things I've done so far is I've mapped out all the keywords we've had so far. There's like around seventy, and I've uh, marked the relationship between them, and this has been really helpful in um, sorting them into like the broad and narrower topics. So we can decide like what's the most important thing that we have to show others. Um, and along with this, I've also analyzed the current book selections. So um, I've looked at all the books we have so far in the database and I've um, mapped out like which, what, what they're essentially about, like what's the most meaningful theme that you can get out of these books. And um, then using that to help map out the topics and keywords. Um, okay. And so back to Merrick. All right, uh, so glossary and mapping is a big challenge. Another challenge that we're working on is uh, community and organizational structure. Uh, this project will have an impact only when it's massive. We need teachers to start using these resources. We need teachers to ask for more. And then early on, we, we knew that Climate Lit will need to become a large community with dozens, even hundreds of contributors and a large specialized editorial team managing content creation, glossary events, trainings, the journal and other spaces. So this means that we're building our membership. We're creating membership categories. We're creating an organizational structure that is able to facilitate the many aspects of the work we're trying to accomplish. And in fact, the, the scale of this task is such that we already have a dedicated undergraduate position to coordinate this work. And this has been Nicholas's uh, job so far. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nicholas Broski. I'm an undergraduate student here at the University of Minnesota. Thank you all so much for showing up and being here on Earth Day. Um, I'm the membership assistant here, so I've been primarily working with sending emails, communicating to all our members, and making sure that the right information gets to the right people 
available at the right time. Um, at the beginning of the year, about a year ago today, we only had a, a little less than 10 members in total. And we've raised that to 70 now, which is really amazing. And that's without having a major advertising campaign or marketing and not even a regular newsletter. So there's a lot of progress to make. And this is um, really good progress for us to have already made. In the beginning, we only had a couple membership categories excuse me, we had our allies, we had fellows, we had editorial advisors, and of course we had editors, and those were primarily our contributors, so people who were writing reviews for us, editing glossary items, but we added editorial um, advisors, oh, excuse me, is that right? Oh, and yeah, ambassadors. we added ambassadors um, and editorial advisors, and they're primarily scholars, um, uh, researchers, and academics in their field who are pioneering climate literacy, climate research, and can add, act as uh, kind of activists for our movement at Climate Lit. So I just want to thank some of them for us today. Uh, thank you so much, Richard Beach, Patrick Curry, Grace Dillon, Sydney Dorbin, Paul Hawken, Jeremy Lent, Bill McKibben, Kimberly Reynolds, Vandana Singh, and Jack Sipes. Thank you so much for being a part of this with us. We also added the ambassador category pretty recently, and those are artists. So authors, illustrators, um, creatives in their fields who can spread um, imaginative ideas and spread climate literacy in their work and also spread our movement as they move around and share their work. And so I wanna thank them as well. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine Applegate, Fiona Barker, Joseph Bouchard, Adam Gitwitz, Barbara Henderson, Carol Lindstrom, Emma Reynolds, John Cheska, Steven Weinberg, David Wiesner. Thank you so much. And we're actually lucky enough to have three of our ambassadors with us today, which you will get to meet later. Most of my work has really been trying to get um, make a system so that all our contributors can message someone and find a way to help us out we want to keep our organization as close to its roots as a uh, member co-op as possible. So really anyone who's interested in assisting us can reach out and find a way to be a part of this movement. We want this to spread like wildfire. Um, thank you. I'll have Nick follow up. Yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, and in addition to getting folks on board in these official capacities, we've also been trying to get folks on board through a series of events. So in the past year, we've had a slew of events. We've had five panels with scholars and educators talking about their scholarship and their pedagogy with Climate Lit. We've had three conversations with writers and one workshop series that spanned borders. That's right, that was an international experience. We've had representation uh, from over a dozen countries, both attendees and panelists, folks zooming in from all hours of the day and night to be with us. Um, and we're super grateful to them and also the 250 people who've attended an event so far. We're really grateful for the interest and commitment that these folks have showed. And if you would like to watch or rewatch any of the, these events, you can find the recordings at climatelit.org slash videos. You'll be able to find this session up uh, on that site pretty shortly too. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about events to come in later on in this program, but I have two exciting announcements. And the first one is, <clears throat> our second prize winner. That's right, we've given away one prize to Nancy Flood. We're getting ready to give away a second prize to Gemma Field. Congratulations, Gemma. You are the winner of a yet to be determined Climate Lit Prize. We are going to contact you after this event and let you know both what you've won and when you are going to receive it. But um, not just Nancy and Gemma get prizes y'all get prizes too. And to introduce what these gifts are, Mary. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this is one of the biggest gifts today is two sessions with wonderful children's literature authors, wonderful earthlings and climate lit ambassadors. And uh, I will have the pleasure of introducing both of our panelists and the moderator. So John Sheshka, is quite possibly, yes, one of the most, one of the best known and most award-winning authors of children's literature in the United States. He's notorious for hilarious, transgressive, and wildly imaginative stories that create new universes and redefine our own. 
Personally, I think that John is a quantum quirk of the universe, the unforeseen in God's creation. And to help us take him seriously, God made John a children's author. And then, not to be outdone, in 2008, the Library of Congress named John the first national ambassador of young people's literature. And since then, John has committed a number of mind-bending books, many of them building young people's love for nature. John is a, the founder of Guys Read, a web-based literacy program for boys whose mission is to help boys become self-motivated lifelong readers. And he's one of the most gracious earthlings I know. Welcome, John. Stephen. <laughs> yes, Stephen is a writer, illustrator, cartoonist, and painter whose work and footsteps have appeared everywhere from Timbuktu to New York. In his alter ego, Stephen sometimes comes up in Google searches as American theoretical physicist, but don't let that blind you to his primary calling as a children's author and nature artist. Stephen paints Catskill Mountains landscapes and fish, especially trout, some of whom he may know by name. He's not part of NASA, but he came up with not NASA, which is an agency that takes you where no one has gone before and is featured in the astronaut series that Stephen and John wrote together. The series includes Earth as a narrator, four mutant superhero animals, and a story of how we should appreciate the absolute uniqueness of our home planet. Welcome, Stephen. And moderating the panel is Nicholas Broski, our assistant, assistant to membership operations at Climate Lit. Nicholas is a sophomore at the Carlson School of Management studying uh, international finance and environmental science policy and management. Nicholas. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Can we just get a mic check and make sure that we can hear both John and Stephen? So if you want to say no. so. That sounds great. I'm all right. Um, wait a second, we might need to reduce a bit of echo on our end, so, but we can hear you. That's John, right? Is Steven yep, here? That's John. I am here. Yes, I'm right here. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much for being here. We just want to make sure that all of our tech is briefly working and set everything up. Thanks. Start with questions. Okay, so wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, both of you. We really appreciate your time. Uh, I grew up reading about the Stinky Cheese Man, and so... This was my childhood and the fact that I get to finally attribute a face to those books is wonderful. And now I'm 20 years old and so time has flown by. Um, our yeah. first question has to do with the video that I believe we sent you. Did you guys get a chance to see that? Of Olaf, I, yes. Of yes. Olaf. Good. Oh, love. I'm here too, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, lovely. And so our idea with that, and I'll, I'll let the audience know what it was, because you'll have a chance to see that soon, is to explore humor in art and in storytelling. And so essentially, Olaf is wandering through a forest. It's very mysterious and dangerous. Crazy things are happening, and he brushes it off like it's nothing, like it's completely fine. And it's a really uh, humorous way to tell the story. And so my question for you two as illustrators and authors and storytellers is, where does humor come in in the creative process specifically for astronauts? What was that like? And yeah, tell me a little bit about how important humor is. Oh, that's the most essential piece of what we do. And that's why when we heard from Merrick what he was up to here with Climate Lit, we realized this is the same thing we do. It's about being educators and teachers. Um, and I was a classroom elementary school teacher for 10 years in New York. And that's exactly the best thing I learned is you teach by telling stories, educating kids and entertaining them. Yeah. yeah. Steven and I like to goof around a lot. That's a huge part. Um, yeah, I mean, quantum quirk, John Sheska nailed it. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, do that from now on. That's my new but yeah, I mean, this quote. is, you everyone here knows how serious the science is so we have to use humor because it, it's it's overwhelming and this is, i think the big problem within the climate crisis world is how you get people to wrap their head around all this so we tried with the first book the most basic humorous thing we could think of which is a fart joke but that's methane so it an all works enormous fart joke that actually unfortunately wrecks an entire planet but that happens <laughs> Yeah, and, and I purposely featured these two slides here. Let's see if I can look at them over on my screen so I know what I'm looking at. But we have, of course, Astro Wolf over there on the left, and he has 
all these wonderful metrics that uh, quantify his greatness, which I thought was super entertaining and, and a fun way to show uh, the superhero's strengths, right? Um, and I think the nice thing about humor is that it sort of acts like a glue. It, it kind of, uh, in your brain, allows you to stick concepts. Um, it allows you to like believe in certain concepts and, and attach them to places in your memory. And so when I look back at like the Stinky Cheese Man or all these books that I would read as a child, the ridiculous, the most ridiculous parts of those were the most entertaining for me. And so I, I completely agree with you guys. Well, um, and that's where the whole series started is Stephen and I were just kind of saying, we'd love to do like a funny series for kids. And like, wh like what's the most important thing happening now? This was like 10 years ago. And we realized it's climate change. And we both looked at each other like, now, how are we going to make that funny and a graphic <laughs> novel? And Stephen's going to have to draw this. And that's where these super powered heroes came from, these characters who have to find a Goldilocks planet. And that yeah. way we got to use every bit of our like math, science, everything we've ever learned from first grade on and threw it in here. Those that's Stephen's bar and whisker plot. Down yeah, there. the box, box and whisker does box not get whisker. enough uh, time. <laughs> <laughs> we also, has, we really I think that has never been used before in children's lit, as far as I could tell. Well, we really had so much fun with playing with information, which is such an important part of everything in climate change. Where in a second book, we just have misinformation where yeah. they meet completely lying elements <laughs> just made up. And yeah. those are the easiest. We don't know where we thought that up, but the clam Senate that runs the entire planet <laughs> is willfully lying to people and just <clears throat> making money off things and willing to swap their planet. <laughs> yeah, clams for prosperity. I don't know who they came from, the, the yeah, clam brothers. Sounds like something yeah. I heard before. Yeah. <laughs> Clam McConnell with no chin. <laughs> uh -oh, We're not uh -oh, subtle at all. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> and also, yeah. I mean, to present this in a graphic novel form, I mean, it's just like the most lush kind of illustration that Stephen and I also were fans of stuff like the Magic School Bus from way back when that was factual, but it put all that stuff on the page in story, in dialogue, in little. Um, like yeah, labels. lots of labels. Yeah, yeah, that was a huge, the Magic School Bus really kind of like, that's what I grew up on. Yeah. And you can never have too many labels and you can never think of one way to read the page because every different, every kid reads differently. So why not let everyone kind of take their eyes where they want them to go? Yeah, I, I think your artwork has really helped like tell that story. How did it work um, with you incorporating these Smithsonian prints? And was that the origin of astronauts or what was the uh, like original pitch essentially? Um, you know, it was part of it was using all of this uh, public domain art. I have like very unusually, my brother is a legal scholar and works with all of these museums who are putting out um, work in the public domain. So he's been bugging me forever of like, you got to do something with this. And the Rijks Museum was the first one to really put a big push on in yeah, uh, Amsterdam. And that book was one. so funny to hear from Michael. We were saying, no way, you can't use all that art from the museum, can you? And he's, yeah, yeah, you really can. And I, I the more we started playing with it, the more I thought it's such a great way as kind of like a, a meta idea of how one's going to fight climate change of like, we need to use every tool in the toolbox. Like, how could I be the only artist we're using? What if I use every artist in history uh, to make these images? And like, you can. And I love that we get to show kids how to use all this art. And it just opens up a whole other element to it. Yeah, there's some very nice Stephen Rembrandt work in here. And then the <laughs> Smithsonian came to us and, and yeah. said, I don't know, would you guys like to collaborate with us? Because they were just starting to put all their stuff online. And they've been great to collaborate with. Yeah, and then they're really amazing to work with. You know, the landscape painting I like to do, I live in the Catskills, like Frederick Church and Thomas Cole, they paint the same scenes I did, or I do. And to get to use their landscapes, which really are in a lot of ways like the seed of American environmentalism, seeing these landscape painters, however else they felt about everything else in the world, they were really showing how beautiful this country is and can be. So that was always in the back of my mind of like when we're going to do the perfect planet for the third book. Yeah. To really show. <laughs> yeah. And show off this like the perfect landscape that was thought of at some point in history. 
Yeah, wonderful. And how did you decide to choose Earth as the narrator? Because I think that is just such a wonderful tool, and really effective. But how and, did that, uh, that was truly a quantum quirk. It was just the most <laughs> wonderful ex accident when Stephen and I were trying to put the book together. It went through a bunch of different early versions, and we were working with our editor Taylor Norman, who is spectacular. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, "I don't know who tells this story," and we we're going like, "Well, it can't be humans because we're the ones." screwing up Earth. And, it, and it's not quite the same if it's any one of the superpowered animals. And I had written an email to her about something about Earth and the narrator will then add something. And she wrote back, Earth, the narrator, that's brilliant. And I went, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant, Earth. The narrator. <laughs> and it is, nice. it's perfect. Who else could tell the story, right? It's Earth. And she's both a little concerned and a little pissed off. It's like, you humans are honestly killing me. Yeah, please go <laughs> find another planet. Find a Goldilocks planet. I'll yeah. help you. <laughs> it has the best distance. I love that idea of like geological time from Earth's perspective. Be like, yeah. you know, I've gone through a lot. You guys have really made your mark. It's true. She gets to talk crap about anybody. Like those dinosaurs stomping around on me. I was kind of glad for a meteor, you know? <laughs> Not the worst thing. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. And I guess we would like to transition to a challenge we have for you. Thank you so much for uh, answering these questions and, and, and talking with us and being with here today, us, with us today. Um, our challenge for you is fairly simple. We'll, we'll give you some time to do it, but we want you to invent a superhero that can help take down the operations of big <laughs> oil. It's, it's pretty spooky. And Stephen, if you don't mind illustrating something for us, and it will allow you to present it at the end. Um, John, I, I would love for you to create a backstory, improvise a backstory, and have it include a cave, Teddy Roosevelt's bushy mustache, <laughs> a hacked ATM, and the line, I totally planned this all along. Uh, we will also, while this is happening, give the audience a chance to enter breakout rooms and uh, re, uh, watch that Olaf video as well as converse with one another. Um, and to re-clarify this, I'm gonna introduce Nick just so that he can tell you again. <laughs> uh, that's right, thank you, Nicholas. Um, so John and Steven, y'all have a challenge, best of luck. Everyone else, uh, attending today, you'll get a chance to go into breakout rooms. Grace, who is not only our content manager, but also our tech guru today, will be putting you into breakout rooms and sharing two links. The first link is to the same Olaf video that John and Steven watched earlier. So you'll have a chance to watch that first. And then in breakout rooms, y'all will have a chance to discuss how humor is working in that clip and how you relate to both humor, climate change, the climate crisis, and climate lit. This is also a way to get to know one another, introduce one another. Um, you will also get a link to a jam board. So that can be a place where you post your reactions, share resources, and it will be an artifact that we will share also after this program is done. So the breakout rooms are going to open. And the last thing I want to say, two things I want to say is that everyone will have until 4.55 to complete their tasks. That's 4.55, that is 20 minutes to either improvise a story, draw a sketch, or introduce one another in breakout rooms. And John and Steven, I don't mean to put the pressure on, but I will be assessing your work. <laughs> no, I am a tough critic. Yes, so the breakout rooms will be opening. We look forward to seeing you in 20 minutes.
Welcome back, folks, as you come in from the breakout rooms. Uh, we'll give folks a time to rejoin us, but to reiterate the stakes of what's happening, John and Stephen have been sent out on a challenge to write an improvised story and to draw a new character. And as y'all were in breakout rooms and as John and Stephen were devising their new story and sketch, we decided here at Climate Lit that I would be too harsh a critic to evaluate this. So I'm bringing it back in, Nicholas, to help evaluate. How did it go, guys? What did you guys create? Oh, oh okay. it's, uh, we can just show you, right? Yeah, I, I think yeah. you should have uh, screen privileges if you want to. Yeah, give Stephen some screen privileges, and I'll just tell you, it turned out to be an incredibly easy challenge. Oh my uh, goodness. This is, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's beautiful. Super easy. I mean, you guys well, give a lot of direction. Yeah, and it was so easy because this is actually a, 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 just a little known chapter in, in world history. This actually happened uh, in January 6th, 1919, when Teddy Roosevelt passed away, or we thought he did. He did not actually die. He just transformed into a superhero to continue the good work he had done, like putting together national parks and things. Um, and weirdly enough, like when he left his human form, he acquired these superpowers, uh, laser eyes, which you can see Stephen has lovingly drawn in there. Um, yeah, we can do uh, action drawing too while you're talking, John. Oh, <laughs> um, his other great weapon is a detachable boomerang mustache, which you can see, and it's been nice. And here, you can see it's tumbling. Oh, look at that! It even moves. Oh. <laughs> That's impressive. And then it can come right back, right there. Um, he also has like every superhero has to has like a little weapon he's got a, a stick turned out to be not really as big as he thought he needed um yeah it's, it's rather stick. small carry and just carry a stick he, like he walks like teddy roosevelt and carries his <laughs> stick uh, and his other weird power which he never even expected was the ability to hack any atm anywhere in the world wow so, weirdly enough his first thought was i should go to midland texas where he did on January 7th of 1919. And it, he found in a cave in Tulsa, or in Midland, I'm sorry. It was going to be Tulsa, but he decided, no, he better go to Midland. He found an okay, ATM. Yeah, draw the cave. And this ATM had all of Big Oil's receipts, even though it was before they were even really big, and they were paying off politicians already. Um, and... That's when a little dog came up to him and the little dog said, how did you do all this, Teddy? He goes, well, uh, I totally planned this all along. <laughs> <laughs> Even really? though he forgot to shave his legs. <laughs> yeah, yeah what, what is the origin behind those legs? Uh... <laughs> well, you know he's a busy thing. man. I mean, he's yeah. going on hikes with John Muir. Before, he just you always saw him, you know, with pants on. This is what Teddy Roosevelt looks like in a superhero leotard and a cape. You know, okay. I wish I had a, a poster because I think this is a, you know, oh, Nick, what do you think? What do you think? Well, I think Nicholas wants to give it a pen. Oh, wait, this back. <laughs> this is going to be tough, guys. Zero one. Zero, zero, zero one. Zero. All right. Well, He's you can grading us in binary. <laughs> wonderful. Yes. No, that, that wow. was awesome. That was really wonderful. I'll let Nick um, take over. Thank you so um, much. Uh, even from a conversion such as myself, that was excellent. <laughs> and thank you both uh, for sharing your time with us and your creativity. Um, before we let you all go and enjoy the rest of the program or go about your day, is there anything going on in your lives creatively, professionally that you all want to share? Wow. So wow. much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we love this program. We are so excited to be ambassadors for Climate Lit. It's so smart. And it's exactly what we wanted to do with the book, too. It's like, we didn't want to end on this downer note and tell kids, like, sorry, we're handing you the earth and it is totally screwed up. <laughs> but you guys have found that right level, of, like, say, educate yourself know what's happening the more you know the better off we are get literate about the climate and that's yeah, why we end with earth saying like i need your help i really don't like you guys too much but <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's why i was so flattered when merrick reached out for the 
The book, this book. Is yeah, beautiful. Where it's like comparing us to Captain Planet was very flattering, but really was like, I mean, I grew up watching that show, but it, it, you know, it didn't quite make sense how you could like beat up the smog monster and then fix smog. Um, you need yeah. like deeper systemic change and it's hard to make a good story about that. So it was what we were trying to do. And then just so flattering seeing there kind of get the fart jokes, not just those, but <laughs> everything. <laughs> yes, it's all connected, right? Everything's exactly. connected. Um, well, we are grateful to you. We appreciate you. And we are glad and I'm glad to share this planet with you. So John and Stephen, thank you so much for your time. And we look our forward pleasure. to seeing more. Also, for those attending, I imagine that copyright privileges are held with the creators um, for that sketch and improvise. Story. No, so if don't you try want to that. take Teddy and a leotard and run with it with his boomerang <laughs> weapon, I think yeah. you're more than welcome. You know, I really, I'd like to see where it goes. Best of but, luck. Uh, but just maintain the basics, like the legs should never be shaved. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, that's the, the only. The stick should always be small. I don't know. I'll give you a little like guidelines. Okay. Char character integrity. Yes, that's Perfect. important. All right, well, thank you both. Um, and we look forward to seeing more work from you all in the months and years to come. Um, all right, thanks guys. Thank you. We have just talked a little bit about where we've been, who we are, how we collaborate, um, and how we might begin to imagine new ways using humor, levity, and hope to provide a better future for the planet. That's right. Um, in this segment to come, we are going to talk a little bit about some of the plans we have for both the immediate future and the far future. And to kick us off, Merrick is going to talk to us about our most recent initiative. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone. This was so impressive. The Teddy Roosevelt hero, I just love it, especially the unshaved legs. I think there is a power, nature raw power there that we could definitely use today. Um, I want to talk about I want to talk about some of our recent developments and some of the visions going forward. So actually, I want to brag about three things. So one is the Center for Climate Literacy. Um, we're super excited to announce that earlier this month, uh, with the support uh, from Dean Michael Rodriguez and the senior leadership team, we were able to launch the Center for Climate Literacy at the University of Minnesota's College of Education and Human Development. This is this is big. Uh, centers are not just created like that. It took us months and months of work. And we are super excited because the center will provide climate lit with institutional support and academic hope. And the context for this is that climate lit was launched as a grassroots uh, cooperative that has no legal status whatsoever. We, it's such a private initiative. And we need legal status to be to publish all kinds of content, to sign contributor agreements, to determine ownership, to secure funding, to partner with organizations and stakeholders. So the center, as part of the University of Minnesota, will provide this legal and administrative support in all of these areas. And one vision for the center now uh, going forward is to secure sustainable funding for climate lit operations and to establish connections with publishers and other organizations. So in relation to this, I'm very, very excited to say that we have just been able to secure our first seed funding in the amount of $35,000. So this is, this is a big, amazing gift, which comes from Dr. Pete Palmer, was a paleontologist and ge uh, geologist whose research on the Cambrian period has expanded our understanding of the evolution of life on Earth. Pete has been incredibly supportive of climate lit, of using stories to help young people grasp the complexity of life on Earth. And Pete, because he's a paleontologist, his special love and interest lies with deep time how everything has been shaped by these larger than human forces that we should work with rather than work against. So on behalf of our entire team, I wanna thank Pete and his family for their amazing generosity. Thank you. The other big achievement we're quite proud of is the launch of a new journal called Climate Literacy in Education. Uh, from the start, 
We wanted Climate Lit to provide space for sharing lesson plans, teacher resources, reflections, reports from projects, class activities, title recommendations, all of these other practical materials for teachers. But we also wanted to, these materials to be not only shared widely, but taken seriously, more seriously than something you publish in a blog. So that's why we came up with an idea of a pocket journal, a journal that will not be a competition to existing academic journals because we only publish short pieces of content, shorter than 2000 words. We also want academic rigor. So we will, this will be a peer reviewed journal, but it will be practical, not theoretical. And climate literacy in education. So the vision for this journal is that it will be an online only open access publication. It will be hosted by the University of Minnesota libraries. And we just got approved for this project, which is also a very big thing. The journal will be run by an editorial collective consisting of seven to 12 editors. And we're now working on assembling the team on uh, drafting ideas for the first issue. And the, the plan, hope, is that we will be able to publish the first issue this fall. And let me just say a few more words about the structure, like what do we do with the journal? So we plan at this point to publish five types of content, uh, content ranging from pieces that are more uh, larger issues in climate literacy education, to like essays, opinions, reviews, to pieces that offer very specific resources for classroom teachers. And we called these two categories, reflections and blueprints. And blueprints specifically will include lesson plans, curricular units, methods, formulas, instructional strategies. And then reflections will be more personal testimonials from teachers and students about, you know, class activities, what works, you know, what works. And among all of these materials that we want to publish, um, lesson plans will probably be central, but also most complicated. And that's why among our editors, we will have teacher educator specialists like Dr. Jana Labella Miller and Dr. Jeff Henning Smith, who can tell you more about, uh, about lesson plans and about our ideas for the journal. If we're able to spotlight uh, Jana and Jeff now. Hi, everyone. I'm Jana Labella Miller, and I'm currently serving as the Director of Initial and Additional Licenses at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and so um, I'm also serving as one of the editors for Climate Literacy and Education. I'm super excited about um, the launch of this new journal. Um, as we've been listening and discussing this afternoon, Central Time, um, words such as hope, collectivity, creativity, and humor are coming to mind and have been repeated throughout our time together. And um, as someone who's working really closely with um, early childhood, elementary, and secondary pre-service teachers and in-service teachers. I'm really excited about this journal as a way to address, um, as one aspect of the journal, as a way to address um, the isolation that some teachers have experienced by doing this work and uh, enacting climate literacy in their own classrooms, but really looking to see where community and collectivity can come together as we creatively re-envision um, what it means uh, to have climate literacy embedded in our curriculum. Um, and so um, Dr. Henning Smith and I have been working with our, with Merrick, with the Climate Lit team and with other editors um, and thinking and connecting ideas of um, some examples out of um, some early examples of uh, work that um, will be included in the journal. So I'll let him explain some of our examples. Thank you so much, John. Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Henning Smith and I'm very excited to be here, be a part of this. Um, I, I kind of have a small part, in, and I think Merrick has done, and, 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 and Merrick and his crew have done so much amazing things. I don't want to act like I've done nearly as much. So I'm just happy to be a part of this team um, to really spotlight the impact of, of climate literacy. Um, right now, um, we have a lot of really neat partnerships, you know, through curriculum instruction in working with the Institute of Global Studies, because as we know, climate and climate change is a, is a global phenomenon, and it's just not isolated. And so how can we help um, teachers see that their work is impactful in their communities, um, both locally and globally, is a big part, I, I think, of the work we hope to do. And so we have lots and lots of examples of really good lesson plans, but we know that lesson plans are only as good as they are in your hands, right? You have to have them, you have to know what they're doing. And so the goal would be to create accessible lesson plans, to create adaptable lesson plans, lesson plans that teachers all over the country can take up and utilize. And so. Part of our, our, our hope is that when we 
when we are given these these plans that we can we can kind of figure out what's the audience and how do we tailor these um, this work to be the most impactful and how do we continue to take the 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 journal work and get it into the hands of actual you know practicing teachers. So obviously, Dr. Obella Miller and I we we work with um, aspiring teachers, but we also have community connections to to local teachers as well. And so the goal would be to keep this journal, to, to, to make this journal a, a connective tissue throughout our pre-service and in-service, right? So we we keep that that focus kind of in, in that continuation. And so I'm, I'm just very excited to be a part of that, excited to, to take the work that we've already been working on and and then and, and get that new work and get it out there and, and figure out how do we broadcast and get teachers to, to take this up in meaningful ways is, is what I'm excited to help with. So thank you, one, Jeff. Oh, I was just going to say, real go quick, ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, one sure. thing as we're in our initial um, launch and um, call for proposals and for for different texts for this um, launch of the journal um, on the slide beforehand, we had um, we're still looking at a connection. But if you're interested or if you know folks who are interested in submitting or learning more about the journal um, to email editors at climatelit.org. Um, and we'll continue to update folks as we um, get more and more examples from our proposals. Thanks, Merrick. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so these are some of the ideas we have about the journal. And of course, this is work in progress. We will probably get a little bit more uh, details now, May in June, so that we're ready for the fall issue. And I'd like to ask uh, Lexi to talk a little bit about our future plans as relating to our mapping challenge. Lexi. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm back talking about more mapping stuff. So the next um, task for us to do is to find the correct visual structure to best represent uh, the data we have. Um, and as you can see on the screen, there's uh, six different charts that we have so far. And obviously, you can add more if we think of some. But uh, even visually, like these are very different. Like you have like the circles versus the squares. And uh, also, something about them is that some of them have different hierarchical structures. Um, so this would be a way to represent the different subtopics that we have. For example, one of our categories right now is uh, kinship with animals, and that could be divided into like different uh, categories like mammals and like reptiles or something. And then even that you have like specific species like endangered species or something they want to highlight. Um, so we need to figure out the best way to represent all that information and then uh, create the topic phrases that would make it easy to find the stories like if you're looking for a specific theme or something it could be easy to find just by like searching. And then um, the last thing would be to sort the current books into their most appropriate categories. Uh, this could be a challenge because many books talk about like multiple different issues and uh, to decide like whether, whether to like fit them into multiple different topics or just focus on one in particular. And next up is Grace and Nicholas. Hi, everybody. It's Grace again, along with Nicholas, and we wanted to discuss with you some of our ideas for the future that we have on the administrative administration side of things. Yeah, so we're looking to grow our membership a lot. Uh oh, I'm out of the frame, but you can still see me. OK, yeah, we're looking to grow our membership a lot, and that really involves uh, establishing some sort of media presence as well as creating a newsletter that can tell our story. So when we do field studies are working with teachers, we can tell you about it and, and also tell you new ways to get involved. Because at the moment, we uh, the, the most help that we need is really in creating contributions. So we're um, looking for extra help outside of that as well. We're all um, oh, sorry, do you mind actually flipping the slide? Okay, thanks guys. Um, we're also looking to establish more friends. So we really thank Pete for uh, his assistance and, and his financial assistance, but we're looking for, for other people who want to either contribute talent in a way, contribute time, whether that's through consulting uh, or, or, or anything like that, or have ideas that they can share with us. Really anything is welcome. And that's what we're uh, looking for as we grow our membership. And yeah, I'll pass it off to Grace. With our growing membership, another thing that we have to be ready for 
is the expansion of our database and the content that our site can produce. So our goal for what we can put on this website is as soon as we can really, we want to have thousands and thousands of pieces of different forms of media and literature that emphasize our goal of climate literacy being a widespread phenomenon. So what we do, Nicholas and I do a lot of work with organizing this data, organizing this content, and then emailing us at editors at climatelit.org. You're emailing Nicholas or I or anyone on the team. And we're taking that information and doing our best to create plans and systems of working that create the most appropriate ways for this media to be implemented into our site as soon as possible. So our plan is to be able to come up with systems to produce a ton of content so we have the bandwidth to reach so many different people with our work. Talking to you again in a second here, Nick will be back with a couple more things to say. Hello again, y'all. Um, following what Grace and Nicholas noted, um, we are looking to not only expand our membership, but we're looking to really expand the content on our site. So in a year and a half, two years time, we want to be in a position where we are publishing annually 100 book reviews, 50 glossary entries, 20 lesson plans, at least 10 teaching reflections and more. Because the more content we have on the site, the more materials that teachers and other educators have to work with young people. So if you are interested in writing for us, if you have content that you would like to contribute, please email us at editors at climatelit.org. And we can talk about either specific requests that we have or how your specific work can be featured on our site. Um, but we not only have content coming up, we also have a slew of events. That's right. Um, as we develop our programming and our rhythm and our content development, we also hope to get in a rhythm of events. So what you see on the slide right now is what we hope to be our rhythm going forward. This summer, Merrick and I will be teaching a summer institute here at the University of Minnesota with in service teachers. And this fall, we tentatively have planned the following events. So we're hoping going forward that we have about one event per month. These will be digital, offered for free, anyone can join. Um, and we're also planning on offering workshops on at least a quarterly basis or as commissioned by you all. So please think about how we might collaborate together. Um, you all know a lot and we would love to learn from you and share what you have to know about climate literacy. So please, um, contact us, editors at climatelit.org, and we can think about how we might co-host an event and bring folks together. Um, before we move on, because we've been talking a lot about what we've done, what our plans are, we don't want to limit ourselves um, to just the nuts and bolts. We want to dream big. Um, and as we move forward into the last 45 minutes of our time together, we're going to start dreaming big. So before we introduce our third panelist, um, I'm gonna invite you for just a minute, just a minute to write down or think in your head of a couple things that you are dreaming about for our future. Big dreams, what that future might look like, what a sustainable world might look like, what you want young people 50 years from now to be experiencing. Take just one minute, think of a few things, and I'll keep the time. All right, folks, what you wrote down, the dreams that you have, we'll have a chance to share them in the final 30 minutes of our time together. So don't let those dreams go away. But without further ado, I would like to have Merrick introduce our next panelist. Yes, I get 
to do the most pleasant things today, introducing wonderful people, introducing our new, uh, our second panel today. So um, featuring this panel is, uh, is uh, another amazing children's literature author and climate lit ambassador, Adam Gedwitz, a very, very good friend, a wonderful earthling. And I was thinking like, how do I introduce Adam? So um, he apparently spent most of his childhood breaking school rules. And then he was grilled at the principal's office, in the principal's office telling stories. And his parents thought he was gonna be okay because he straightened himself out in high school, but old habits die hard. And before long, he was in cahoots with second graders again, this time as a teacher, filling their heads with unbelievable stories. So one mom, yes, and one mom happened to be a literary agent and she encouraged Adam to write these stories down and he hasn't stopped since. Uh, his retelling of the Grimm's fairy tales, A Tale Dark and Grim, became a three book series, award-winning series, and also now a very successful Netflix show. His medieval multicultural novel for older audiences, The Inquisitor's Tale won the Newbery Honor in 2017. And then his Unicorn Rescue Society books uh, put a completely new spin on, on young people's fight to protect Earth's biodiversity. Uh, in this book uh, that, um, that Nick showed earlier, this book just came out. It's a, it's a scholarly collection, but it has 17 authors and artists and illustrators uh, also contributing content. And John and Stephen also contributed content. And in a piece that Adam wrote for this book, he says, that we're hardwired for caring. And he says that we are natural creatures and we know it. We do not need parables about the earth destroyed. We need stories that wake us to ourselves. Adam has been a champion of a living earth and a wonderful, wonderful author. And we're so grateful for the stories he creates. And uh, moderating this panel with questions are three undergraduate honor students from the seminar on fantasy I have taught this spring. Kai Ressler, Dorothy Lee, and Sean Hassey Oliver. And for resumers. Hello. Thank you again so much for coming, Adam. I'm Kai. And as Merrick said, I'm part of his fantasy honors seminar. Um, and I am a great lover of your Unicorn Rescue Society books. Um, we are currently working on climate lit reviews for some of your books. Um, and at Climate Lit, we know that biodiversity loss, habitat loss, and pollution that kills plants, animals, and other species are some of the most serious challenges we are facing in a climate changing world. We are facing the near extinction of many animals and species in our world. Um, in your series, the animals in danger are all very unique mythical creatures. I was wondering why you chose to have Eli and Uchana go on quests to save magical creatures rather than real world ones. That's a good question. It's a tough one. I think um, it probably just gets back to me personally. Um, you know, as we do uh, this work of uh, advocacy for climate lit and any other advocacy that we believe uh, we must do, and there is much advocacy to be done, we have to really, I think, rely on what is makes us uh, passionate, what motivates us. So for me, I mean, I remember my editor, uh, who is a uh, very well-known editor in publishing. Her name is Julie Strauss-Gable, and she's a tough lady. And she once asked me, Adam, are you ever going to write a book that doesn't have a dragon in it? And I remember, I remember my response being, why? Right? I think dragons are awesome, and I think mythical creatures are awesome. And so uh, for me, like that, that inspired me more than anything. It was the genesis of the series. Um, uh, and so uniting that with a goal that was... Um, uh, so socially important, like biodiversity in the in the globe, only made sense to me. So for me, it's because of what makes me want to write and want to turn pages. And in that regard, those things that inspire you can also help children to be inspired to take care of the toad they see in their lawn and to help um, the creatures they see around them. Yeah. Are you hoping that they're going to take that away from your books? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, I very much, um, you know, so many of the threats that the creatures face in these books, some of them are are very clearly environmental, such as when the evil Schmoke brothers are looking to cut down a redwood forest in the um, Pacific Northwest. 
uh, ostensibly to log it, but in fact to find a Sasquatch. Um, and they have their own nefarious reasons for finding Sasquatch, which I will give you a spoiler and I will tell you, which is that um, they have a serious hair loss problem and they believe that Sasquatch is, uh, holds the key to them regrowing their hair. But, um, <laughs> Um, uh, but so sometimes it's a very explicit uh, environmental threat. Other times it's a political threat. So in the book that you have in the center there, um, Chupacabras of the Rio Grande, um, uh, the government has hired contractors, again, the Schmoke brothers, um, to build a border wall um, through Laredo, Texas. And uh, they only discover that this is the problem, the root problem, because there's a baby Chupacabra who's on the loose. Um, and so they have to find a way to reunite him with his family. Because um, as we know, you know, environmental justice is political justice, is social justice. They're all related. So I want kids, really my motivation in uh, what I want kids most to feel when they read these books is first, love for the world and its creatures, and second, outrage at hypocrisy and injustice. There's a lot of hypocrisy and injustice in these books, and there's a lot of hypocrisy and injustice in the world. And so if they can find a way to power their outrage through love, uh, that's, that's a sustainable way of trying to save the world, um, one creature or habitat at a time. That's really lovely. And I believe Dorothy will be coming in with a couple more questions for you. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. Hi, I'm Dorothy. Like Kai said, thank you so much for your time. I also really enjoyed the, uh, the Unicorn Rescue Society books. And one thing that stuck out to me was how each individual book is set in a different culture from like New Jersey to Spain and the Himalayas. And I personally really enjoyed reading about all these different people and cultures. And I was wondering why you chose to include creatures from all these different cultural traditions in each individual book and how this kind of ties into the co-authorship in this series. Yeah, so that's, thank you, Dorothy. It's a great question. So. Um, when I first conceived of the series, um, I wanted it to be different creatures and different creatures from different cultures, mostly because every creature has, um, every culture has many mythical creatures. There are thousands and thousands, if not millions of mythical creatures that have been invented by cultures around the world. Um, and so I was really excited to explore all of them, uh, just as every culture has its Kanish, every culture has its, you know, Loch Ness monster. And yet, me being an American Jewish white guy would write from a very specific perspective. Um, and there are so many incredible authors out there who are either already wildly successful or insanely talented, but haven't, hadn't yet you know, achieved success that I thought, why don't I pair up with them? And then we can do something much more authentic. One of the guiding principles of the books is something is accurate is it, if you can look it up on, on Wikipedia or an encyclopedia and all of the facts are, are correct. Something is authentic if somebody from that place or that culture reads it and says, this book reminded me of home. And that was always our goal. Um, and in fact, we got a few letters, one in particular that I will never forget after the Chupacabras book came out, um, a librarian from Laredo wrote to me and literally said those words, I read this book and it reminded me of home. And uh, nothing, nothing make me, makes me prouder than that. So for each book, I collaborated with an incredible author. So the Chupacabra's book is David Bowles, who is an author and professor who lives in the Rio Grande Valley. The Sasquatch book, uh, this is just out of order. Joseph Bruchak, a Native American author, writing um, about the Native American traditions of Sasquatch and Bigfoot. Um, in Madre Aguas of Cuba, writing with Emma Otegi, a Cuban American author. Um, and for the Pakistani book, uh, Secret of the Himalayas, with the incredible author, Hena Khan. And in each case, we would trade back and forth. Um, they would come up with which creature they wanted to write about and sort of the idea of the story. And then uh, we'd create the outline together. And then we'd trade chapters back and forth. And it was an incredibly important conversation uh, in the process of writing for, for me and hopefully for the other author as well. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, uh, how do you hope to see these different cultures represented for, uh, for the children who read your book? Like, what do you hope for them to take away? Yeah, so if they're from that culture, then I want them to feel seen and celebrated, like their culture is awesome and they should know that. And if they're not from that culture, um, I want them to 
first of all, see it as an awesome culture that should is worthy of being celebrated, worthy of being protected. I think part of protecting biodiversity is protecting cultural diversity, right? When you eliminate environments and ecosystems, you eliminate ways of life and you eliminate peoples. Um, and so protecting cultures as well as the planet, those are the same goal as far as I'm concerned. So I want kids to love those cultures, to see them as awesome and amazing, so that just like the creatures and just like the planet, the kids desperately want to be allies in protecting those cultures. Yeah, that's super cool. I'm going to hand this off to Sean now. Right. Hi, Adam. As uh, Dorothy said, I'm Sean. Um, so reading the series, I was very interested in the Schmoke brothers, especially considering they're rather comical in some sense. Uh, they are cartoonishly evil, they lose every time, and they grovel in defeat. Given that this is <laughs> towards children, it makes sense that the villains are somewhat laughable. Uh, however, in portraying the Schmoke brothers this way, it can make the issues the book addresses seem a little too easy to solve. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you reconcile making the series tailored to its audience? with making sure the series is accurately depicting the difficulty and seriousness of the challenge that is climate change? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, it, it was definitely an idea of the kids need to feel like they have the power to succeed. Um, uh, the Schmoke brothers, um, you know, no relation to other big bad guys in the world whose names sound very similar. Um, the, uh, the Schmoke brothers, do have an enormous, enormous resources, enormous global reach. They show up everywhere. Um, and it can be overwhelming. I mean, the problems that our planet faces uh, environmentally and politically and socially um, are daunting to adults. And so for children, they can be daunting too. So I come out of a tradition of writing fairy tales and retelling fairy tales. And the key in writing a good fairy tale, in my view, is that you have a, a protagonist the reader cares about. You have a challenge that seems really difficult and then the protagonist succeeds, they, they triumph. And the reason for that is fairy tales for children play the role of teaching them on a psychic and emotional level that no matter how difficult the things they're going through are, they can succeed. And so similarly, I wanted the Unicorn Rescue Society to feel like, yes, I mean, things are difficult, but in the end, these kids are triumphant over the Schmoke brothers. Uh, for this age group, that felt really important to me. Yeah. Um, and then I think one last question we had to wrap up here was, uh, do you have any other books coming out for the series or plans on any film or TV show adaptations you'd be interested in sharing? Uh, yeah, I mean, so we're definitely um, got to write a seventh book because spoiler alert, they haven't found a unicorn yet. It is called the Unicorn Rescue Society. They should probably find one. Um, and uh, yeah, there has been a lot of interest in, in making this into a TV show. We're not in development right now, but um, we have meetings all the time about it. It certainly would, would work. It would fit as a TV show. Um, but um, right now it's mostly, I'm just focusing on it as books, uh, telling stories to the kids and um, seeing how the kids uh, take it and adapt it themselves. I get a lot of books of Uchenna stories. They love Uchenna in particular. So books about Uchenna um, uh, breaking up the world, uh, the bad guys of the world and uh, saving the climate. So yeah, so that's mostly what we've been doing these days. Well, that's great to hear. I look forward to hearing, seeing any more books or hopefully a TV show in the future. And next, I'm going to hand it off to Nick. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Adam. I'm super tempted to ask you about that unicorn in the seventh book. Maybe, <laughs> but I don't. I don't want to. No spoilers. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, Adam, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Um, I know you're busy. You've been writing a lot. Um, and communicating across the country presents its own temporal challenges. So thank you for this time. Thank you for your work. Um, and we appreciate being on this earth with you. Uh, thank you. And I just want to say thank you all for this work that you're doing. It's so crucial. And I'm so glad that a concerted effort is being put forward. I've been listening to the things you guys are working on. And I'm so impressed. Um, and I'm glad you guys exist. So thank you. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Um, as we collectively um, begin to think about how the fantastic 
the magical, the soon to come might crumb, come to fruition. And before we do that, lest we forget, we have a third prize winner. That is right. We have a third prize winner. And that prize winner is Tanya Nathaniel. Tanya, congratulations on winning Climate Lit's third door prize drawing. We will contact you after this event to let you know what you have won. Um, but let's hope that we all come out winners <laughs> after, uh, after this event, um, because we are about to spend the next 10 minutes in breakout rooms. Um, Grace has shared a link in the chat with you. That will take you to a Google Doc. Um, there it is. So if you click on that link, it will go to a Google Doc. When you open that Google Doc, um, it will show you the following prompts. So if Nicholas uh, can help me in advancing the slide, uh, you'll see that when you get into breakout rooms, we would love to hear from you about what you want from us. We've talked about our plans, our vision in a general sense, but we want to know specifically what resources you want, what would be helpful to you in your particular contexts, um, and some of your dreams that you wrote about earlier. So um, 10 minutes in breakout rooms. If it's helpful to have one person volunteer to take notes, please do so. Um, but be sure you click on that link in the chat, which will open up that document in your browser. Um, and we look forward to seeing what you have to say. We will see you all in 10 minutes. Hello, folks that are returning to the main room. We're going to give folks another few seconds to uh, rejoin us. But as they do, um, I want to begin our process of thanking everyone for joining us today. Um, there's a lot going on, a lot of celebrations happening today, celebrating our Earth. And we really appreciate you all giving your time to us this afternoon or this morning or this night, wherever you're zooming in from. Um, we're grateful to you. And as folks repopulate the room, I also want to express my gratitude to you all for giving us your thoughts on the Google Doc. We are gonna take those ideas and suggestions and use them for our planning in the future. So thank you for that. In the final 15 minutes, uh, we want to be sure to let you all know um, how appreciated you are and reiterate one more time how y'all might get involved with us. So Grace, thank you Grace, has just put a link to a Google survey in the chat. Um, that's a formal way of letting us know how you might like to collaborate, what you would like from us, um, and any other ideas that you have for Climate Lit. You will also get a link to that survey in the post-event email that should go out on Monday, so you can check your inboxes for that. But you're also always welcome to contact us at editors at climatelit.org. And before I hand things off to Merrick to conclude us for today, I want to announce our fourth and final Climate Lit Secret Prize. That's right. Wild applause in the room. Um, our fourth prize goes to Abby Jacobs. So Abby, thank you for all the work you do on the website. Thank you for registering and check your inbox for the prize you will receive. Um, that's all I have for you today. Um, from me, thank you so much. And Merrick will leave you with a few more concluding thoughts. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, this has been such a wonderful panel. I don't want it to end, uh, uh, but I, I wanna say a few words of thanks to everyone who made it possible. First of all, thank you to all of you who uh, showed up for, for this session. We appreciate your time, two hours on Zoom. That's a, that's a lot to ask. Uh, we want to thank um, our the members of Climate Lit team, uh, our ambassadors, our friends, our allies, editors, uh, everyone on the team, and uh, especially people that we, we cannot name everyone, but our website designer, Abby Jacobs, our wonderful uh, illustrator, Tin Javier, um, uh, Steve, uh, Steven, who designed this wonderful uh, visual for uh, today's uh, Earth Day Fest. And, and really everyone who, who has supported our work so far. Uh, 
we need you all. Together we're stronger and together we can do so much more. Um, please join us in any capacity that you're able to. Climate Lit will only work when it's a massive effort, when we reach uh, teachers and students in all schools uh, across the nation and internationally. Please share the word about Climate Lit with people you know. We hope to see you soon and to work with you. Happy Earth Day, everyone, and thank you.